Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so I guess you're here for the right talk. Um, uh, quickly, Tafik and Hendrik, gloves off. Um, good to see some Cape Town faces, but I'm trying to uh, do it this side too. So quickly, this is going to be SQL, uh, Postgres SQL Lite and Code Heavy. Um, and also kind of an introduction, but hopefully you find it as interesting as I find it. Um, so maybe just as before I start, as an aside, um, if it loads. Um, at the moment, I'm studying InfoSec at Rhodes, part-time, a master's, and they love torturing us. So they gave us 30 gigs worth of network data to process. Now, my first gut feel is pandas. I killed my machine a couple of times, um, but I noticed that pandas had some cool stuff around uh, SQL. Um, I got a little part of the way in uh, using Postgres itself, um, but in the end, uh, we had to use much more manual tools, but to give you an idea of what's running on a, a university network, um, US and Russia are in a little competition to have the most uh, traffic on a university network. Um, but I'll talk more about why this is interesting. And, and, and this is kind of where, so I've been uh, using a lot of async code for the last year and recently saw more how it benefited me in really large data sets, not just in uh, programming. Um, some stuff about me, uh, I'll go into more detail from Cape Town, uh, run a WASP Cape Town. Uh, I work for Control, I'll talk about that more. Um, I've worked as a Python dev for a couple of years, DevOps, uh, lots of Amazon uh, experience. Uh, oh, and my favorite quote, to err is human, to automate it is DevOps. And I've seen this countless times. Um, so who I work for at the moment, uh, we are launching soon, so you wouldn't have seen us yet, but we're building easier insurance in an app uh, with an API in the background. Uh, so I don't know if you can see it, but I um, inherited Firebase from uh, some other developers who were working on it first, and I yearn for the day to move it to uh, JSON on Postgres. Um, then uh, what I do in my other time is was Cape Town, so the local chapter, there used to be one in Johannesburg, kind of faded out. So we keep it alive in Cape Town, and as part of OWASP, uh, we help B-Sides, a security conference. Uh, it's in December, 1st of December in Cape Town. Uh, cheap, community run, lots of fun, and hopefully I can entice you to come. So that was our first electronic badge we built, ESP8266, uh, Wi-Fi connected. We tracked uh, people's uh, uh, networking during a conference. It talked back to a Django server, and we were able to do analytics on human behavior at InfoSec conference. Um, we built another badge, this time without a screen. Uh, looks like a flux capacitor. Uh, although driving that many RGB LEDs, you had to strap a, a power bank at the end. So uh, our call for papers is over, but you're welcome to attend. And to give you an idea, the same person who's behind these badges, and I've unfortunately broken this, but this year DEF CON in the US, uh, the Monero, the guy behind Monero built a badge, which you can play Pong, Snake, um, got a SDM32 in it and powered by the lovely cells in your laptop and it dies very quickly. Um, but that's the kind of cool stuff we, we try and, uh, try and uh, do at B-Sides. It's not just InfoSec, it's not just securing your code. It's getting together for uh, one day and a weekend. Uh, there's a capture the flag, there's a lot of fun stuff that we do. So you're not here for B-Sides, so let's talk a little bit about um, async code around Postgres. Um, just some limitations. I'm a Python dev, so a lot of it's going to be Python. Um, I would not bring it down upon you to do Node or JavaScript. That's my day job sometimes, so uh, 
It's around a lot of Python's uh, async IO, um, UV loop I'll, I'll talk about later, um, and some libraries. And I've taken some sample databases uh, that I could find on Kaggle, um, something with around a million, million records to see uh, what, what the performance would kind of look like just on my own machine. So I'm not running it in AWS's cloud or anything like that, just on my machine on, on, on the host. Um, so this is kind of the outline that we're going to talk about. What is async just to kind of get a, a refresher on it. So for those who are already doing it, I'm sorry about this. Why async? Uh, we're going to look at some async code, libraries, um, look at some code again, and squeezing more out of it. And then do you profit or is it code nirvana? So what is async? Who's working in some kind of async code base at the moment? Who's loving it? OK. It's a good sign. Um, I'm still in, a, still in the honeymoon phase for the most part with async. Um, but luckily, unlike the Node community, um, that honeymoon period lasts longer than a week. Um, <laughs> look, all I'm going to say is when I update my NPM libraries, I pull my hair out. I've had a bug where the only fix, and I went on Stack Overflow and gave this answer, was delete all your node packages, install again, and Ionic works. Um, so why async? So uh, when we uh, build applications, uh, we tend to just build quick, like something like Rails or Django or Flask. We just build, and later, later on we figure out um, how we're going to optimize it. But um, this is actually from a Stack Overflow, a great, great source of information and horribly insecure code. But this guy is uh, right that um, a lot of the applications that we write, especially in our AWS, Google Cloud, and Azure um, environments, um, is going to hit disk and network a lot. So even if you're running Postgres through RDS uh, or MySQL, I'm sorry, I'm going to say MySQL a couple of times here, but uh, not out of pleasure, purely out of uh, reference. So um, we're going to hit a lot of uh, cycle costs on network and disk where uh, our CPUs are quite, quite optimized to do what they do. RAM is still slow, but way, way faster. So um, we want to do things in an asynchronous way, and we also don't want to bite the cost of multi-threading and multi-processing where we're spending a lot of time either um, context switching, syncing, and we're using a lot of resources. So uh, just to kind of describe what, what the general idea behind it is, you've got uh, work coming in, you put it on event loop, um, it gets scheduled to do either something with the file system, a database, computation, uh, network. Uh, if we focus a little bit more on, on it, uh, some work gets put on a queue. Um, it's managed, on a, for the most part, on a single-threaded environment, and it's just optimized. So instead of just running a lot of code all at the same time, we're scheduling, scheduling it the right way to optimize for the slower parts of what we're doing. Um, so let me just show you a really uh, fun little animation, or actually it's JavaScript. Of course it's JavaScript. Um, so just to kind of illustrate what it looks like, um, so obviously JavaScript made uh, async sexy for some while and then uh, other, other things happened. Um, but we uh, put things on the queue, eventually it gets called, and work uh, happens kind of out of the normal order you would imagine, but uh, much more optimized. Uh, and I'm going to uh, put the slides up and whatever code I have if anyone wants to follow some of this. Um, so one of our best examples of a really good async system is Nginx versus Apache. Uh, we've all seen Apache fall over in production because of all the, the strain we put it under. And Nginx, the programming model, just makes a lot more sense. Uh, it looks a little bit more like that. And um, at the end of the day, it's a, uh, it's a web service, so it's event-based. A lot of events happening, uh, different responses and request times. 
Um, so why async? Um, for some of you, it kind of makes sense already, but uh, we, we still have to ask this question. It, it's not uh, just assumed. Oh, goodness, I didn't time myself, but I'll, I'll figure it out. So um, especially in terms of writing code, in terms of the cost on your systems, uh, if you focus mostly on the right, um, I'm not going to go into processes and threads a lot, um, but um, we optimize waiting periods. And often, if you debug your code, you'll find that's where a lot of your time is wasted, unless, uh, let's say, you're doing pandas, um, where there's a lot of computation. Something like an API is waiting a lot for a database to reply, or a web server. Um, good scalability, um, and you're not specifically, in my example, Python, you're not fighting with a global interpreter lock. So one thread executing at one time. No multiple threads. There are some workarounds around it, but um, if you look at the programming frameworks and stuff that formed around it, it is a nightmare to debug and write. Um, so this is kind of the crux of it. Um, we know that Postgres is fast. So from my experience, I, I remember this so well. Uh, I worked for a company that was doing Odoo, so it's a Python-based uh, ERP system. And Postgres was the workhorse of the system. But um, we had some clients always complaining about how long things were taking. So uh, I go to the client, I look at the, the really expensive, really beefy, nice Dell server. And there's nothing wrong with the Dell server. They've given the VM enough RAM. Everything seems like it should work until I put uh, Postgres debug logs on and the application's debug logs. And the application was just nailing um, Postgres with terribly written queries. And the sequence of it was, was just uh, killing uh, Postgres. And what they'd done is just created more and more of a pool, more connections, putting it more under strain. Um, so we want to optimize for um, React. Um, the waiting times, the sending, um, some queries are going to take long to come back. Um, we're not necessarily that worried about the sequence they're coming back in. And I mean, we've, we've got async in uh, Postgres already with replication. So this, this model just makes a lot more sense. Um, so if we look at kind of the architecture for for Postgres, we want to minimize the amount of um, client connections that we're making. So you, if you look at PG Bouncer, uh, a lot of these kind of workarounds we have, because threading and multiprocessing, we've killed Postgres. Uh, sometimes our solution, for the most part, was um, horizontal scaling with reading nodes. Um, but what we want to try and do is, can we use the client as optimized as possible? without waiting um, and have less uh, client connections. So uh, let's have a quick look. Oh, I skipped something, but we'll get back to code. Um, if we look at some of the libraries, um, it's gotten really easy to do this. Uh, I love how many, uh, you just Google this and a ton of libraries come up. Um, so the, the actual C library for Postgres itself has uh, asynchronous command processing. Um, and this you'll find used a lot. Uh, Golang, for instance, you can implement this as well. Um, and, and purely, it's just the programming model of firing off a query and not waiting for it to return. Um, waiting, uh, you, you're calling it later on. Um, so uh, we go on to uh, Python. Um, so in the past, we've always used Psycho uh, PG or Psycho PG2. Um, it's pretty fast because it's written in C um, with Python wrappers, but um, some people um, have their gripes with Python's DB API 2.0. Um, so they've wrapped that library around with async IO, so Python's standard library uh, async um, wrappers. And it runs much faster because it's not waiting. But you still have some of the performance and feature characteristics of, uh, of PsychoPG. Um, and that's kind of what the code looks like. There's a little bit of boilerplate around uh, using async. But I mean, if you're coming from a, a 
kind of JavaScript promises world, that syntax makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, so where a lot of my talk is going to focus around and, and what I've been working with, um, I love Magic Stack. They do some amazing work. Um, so my API is actually written um, around uh, their UV loop, which is taking libuv, uh, the event loop from Node.js, and uh, plugging it into async IO that Python uses. So from the kind of start, uh, Python's async IO decided, let's swap out the event loop if people want to. Uh, it's their choice. The only thing is UV loop is uh, quite a lot of dependencies to install. So some people prefer the easier to debug and read async IOs standard event loop, um, but back to async PG. So they looked at AIO, AIO PG and decided they could, they could improve a little bit. There's a couple of things they can do. So they, uh, they looked at Postgres SQL's binary IO uh, protocol, uh, prepared statements, and also just writing some of the libraries in Cython and then using async IO with UV loop. And uh, it works really, really well um, if you look at the code for it, a little less boilerplate, easy to read. Um, so um, for those you might not know, Python now has the async await uh, syntax, but um, they're still developing some uh, features to remove some of the boilerplate um, to actually start up the event loop or get the event loop. Uh, interestingly enough, I've run into a bug recently on uh, Jupyter Notebook um, using uh, async IO and some multiprocessing stuff because um, uh, Jupyter is already using an event loop and you're trying to kind of um, work against it. Um, we also have PUE async, so a full-on ORM. Um, and again, I'm going to use the Dirty word MySQL, uh, async IO MySQL, um, a lot of cool features, uh, an ORM. And uh, here's a couple of other libraries, sorry about the blue. Um, Golang, Node.js, PHP, um, and even Python, Python SQL Alchemy, which is a popular um, ORM, has an async as well. So uh, let's look at some code. Uh, why not? So uh, just to get back to async PG, uh, it all kind of comes around these kinds of articles they write. They've done the same thing with uh, UV loop. They build things and then they test it against other libraries and they come up with um, their testing methodology. So I'm, I'm a sucker for reading these kinds of things, but at the same time, I'm always skeptical at how much is the performance really, and what does their data set look like? So I couldn't actually find their database to replicate it, um, but it's some uh, good stuff to go on. So first of all, I got a fairly large database uh, called Consumer Complaints and just loaded it all up into one table. So I had a lot of records using Pandas to, uh, to clean it up. Um, and is this one. And then I just looked at uh, what kind of performance, what kind of, um, what kind of uh, issues I might get around. Does everyone see that, by the way? I can zoom in. Um, so uh, before I start, maybe. So just to give you an idea of how many records are on that table. Um, Uh, so a bunch of records around uh, consumer complaints found. So um, not necessarily an interesting data set, relational, or, or anything like that. But I just wanted a lot of records so that I had to sift through a lot of data. Um, so uh, just that's kind of just an example of using async um, in Python uh, with the async IO sleep. So certain uh, functionality in the standard lib 
um, they had to rewrite because it's blocking. Um, so async iOS sleep is a good example of that. Um, then uh, to actually kind of get some metrics out of it, I took out a old uh, friend of mine, this great uh, decorator. I need to remember that this one was for synchronous code and luckily found an async one. So I'm just going to decorate uh, methods that I've written and it'll give me an idea of how long it's executing. So obviously the, async, uh, the synchronous code was easy to measure. Uh, it would, I was getting great results only to find that all the data was still coming. Um, so just as an example, you just use PsychoPG2 uh, without pooling, a kind of synchronous library in a synchronous way, um, and a lovely error message from it as well. Um, and we'll see how long that takes. So across the whole table, we're just doing a select count and a select all uh, to see what we get. So we generally have about a seven second run um, for, for all those records. Um, now we get to some interesting uh, async codes. So a similar setup as the Psycho PG, I'm just gonna execute uh, two queries um, without pooling once again, um, and then see what happens. And uh, do note, that I am closing connections as I go along. Um, otherwise, we're gonna have some trouble later on. Um, so we get a couple of records back and we already have a bit of an improvement, uh, 5.43 seconds. So um, not looking into it any deeper, but we've probably cut down on some of our IO, our weight on the connection itself. Um, so now it makes me think, how about we kind of fire a lot more off at the same time? Um, using some of async IO's uh, functionality around gathering m multiple tasks. Uh, so um, similar, but uh, we'll see if it, if it gives us a bit of a performance uh, benefit as well. So Okay, I'll move faster. Uh, I actually thought I was going to be too fast this time around. Um, okay, so uh, another one, uh, because I want to show you some other stuff as well. Uh, we're just adding a lot more, kind of just part of why I'm doing this. Uh, the, uh, the library that I'm using, async PG, um, it uh, does some caching on the queries itself. Uh, it has a bit of caching built in itself, not just from uh, Postgres' side. So I want to throw it off a little bit with different kinds of um, queries just to see what happens. And uh, by the way, if you wonder about the power of async, async is powering Jupyter Notebook. And that's why I'm able to do just a wait without any boilerplate. Um, and fairly similar results uh, the way we're executing it. Um, we've pipelined it pretty well um, and we're getting results back and then obviously closing it off. Um, so let's see where we are. So um, how can we kind of squeeze more out of this? Um, so if you think about like doing something with pandas, something kind of data science-y, um, we're gonna maybe wanna try and use more of the CPU. So there's a great library called AIO, AIO Multiprocess by a guy from Facebook, and they're still using Python in a kind of object store, and the way that they scaled it is they uh, fork processes with each one its own event loop, which then calls back to a main process with all your data, so you kind of chunk it up. So um, I've broken my code, but I'm kind of gonna show you what, what the basic idea behind it is. Um, uh, right, so um, we've got, um, so uh, first of all I'm using Python's multiprocessing uh, library just to get the CPU count. Um, we set up a bunch of queries and oh, I've commented all out but 
um, using the AIO multiprocess library, we can create a pool of processes with event loops. So if you take your data set, say it's four, uh, four million lines, you've got four processes to use, you chunk it up into four, you run each separately, and then you aggregate it at the end. So kind of a four times speed up, um, potentially. Um, so async and Postgres, uh, from a developer's perspective, from scaling, uh, especially from a Python world where a lot of the Golang cool kids uh, laugh about your speed. Um, it's easier code to read. Um, you're using the network much better. You're um, potentially utilizing Postgres' um, uh, resources better. Um, so then profit, how do we... What do we make of this? So now that you have uh, more resources, don't profit that way. Um, so literally someone told me the other day that on their, and luckily I forgot the guy's name. So in his defense, in his uh, Kubernetes cluster, he runs it. Whenever there's uh, spare uh, resources, he runs a Monero miner on it. Um, but uh, we want to scale Postgres with our application, not scale Postgres for our application. That's kind of what I want to get at because um, I've worked at a company that said Postgres is too slow. What did we do? MongoDB. What happened? We need relations. We need uh, unions. We need proper queries. What did we do? We built a ORM in Python to do these things on Mongo with a DSL. So how do you think that performance went? And this was a month before the JSON fields came out. Um, yay, Mongo. Um, so personally, at the moment, um, I'm, I'm demoing or uh, building proof of concepts around uh, long data. I've got a lot of JSON data. I'm going to store it in Postgres. If we look at this graph, I'm going to test it for myself to see if this is actually true. But if we can get latency that low and request per second or rows per second that fast, then there's definitely some... Uh, something behind this. We're not just running multiple threads and trying to, to uh, bring poor Postgres to its knees. Um, so as an async joke, here are the steps that you can follow. Um, uh, so, and I hope you get some learnings. So I'll wait for you to, to get your learn, learnings async. And then questions. and lots of cool stuff to go check out. I was, I was just going to comment. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Twisted uh, Python. Say again? Twisted Python. Yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> sorry. They, they, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the database adapter, they are all they are based on callbacks and event driven. It fits in nicely in the network paradigm also. Just repeat that. It fits in nicely in the networking paradigm also. The yeah. Twisted uh, library. So um, I don't know if you've followed Twisted lately. So uh, a lot of the, the learnings from Twisted ended up in async I.O. I don't think Twisted's going to disappear, but um, it's kind of a good thing to have everything in the standard library. Um, JavaScript for the most part, has async built in from the start, where we get it afterwards and running frameworks and stuff, um, where I would say twisted might not be the right way to go. So um, is that you've got a big code base now to maintain while following async IO, following tornado. Um, still great work. They've influenced async IO a lot. Um, and Async I was literally, they, in some of the videos the guys say, they literally steal ideas from other guys. So from C Sharp, Twisted. Um, so we've had these paradigms before. We've had good Postgres. Uh, Crossbar IO is another good example. We were building a Postgres. Uh, um, we actually had a fun memory leak with a decorator on a decorator to Postgres and then connections just going like that and then the box running out of RAM. Um, so it's already existed. These are just kind of easier to use tools and debug 
and uh, the speed side of things kind of make it nicer to use if that answers the question. Hi there, Krista. Um, nice talk. I had a question about, um, you mentioned in your talk, you mentioned about um, async ORMs. Um, do you have any experience with them and any like, comments on using async ORMs? Um, so I've started to look at, I haven't really used it yet, but I've, look, um, I've, I've helped debug uh, Peewee async before. I think it was Peewee async um, in crossbar I.O. So um, it's, it's still a bit slow. Uh, the same with Jinja 2 is getting an async version. Uh, it's still a bit slow, but you're kind of, you're able to preempt things. So load things while it's, it's doing some of its work. You can continue down the stack and then return it. But I can't tell you too much about it. But um, the problem, though, is that async PG, because it's so different, uh, I don't think any ORM supports it at the moment. So you're still going to be stuck with AIO PG or wrapping psycho PG or a synchronous ORM around the async stuff. Uh, come chat to me afterwards if you want to, and if you want to see the badge or ask about B-sides. And thanks a lot. <laughs>